Well, let me welcome everyone back to our video message here on Wednesday evening at Mars Hill Baptist Church in Hillsborough, North Carolina. My name is Daniel Gregory, and I'm pastor here. Let me welcome you. I do hope God blesses you richly through our Bible study here together tonight. Um, let me start with two things very quickly. First, my encouragement is um, that you will continue to keep in contact with the church uh, through our Facebook page, as well as our church's website. Uh, those two are on the screen right now, so I'll encourage everybody to continue um, to connect that way. Uh, if you haven't liked our Facebook page, please do so. Um, there, we will be announcing when we have articles available, uh, when we have messages like this that have been uploaded and are available for our Sunday morning services, as well as our Wednesday night, uh, and also any other videos that I might uh, might post uh, sometime during the week. Uh, also, if we have any big announcements, uh, they're going to be up on Facebook, uh, so please keep, in, keep connected that way. Also, keep connecting with our church's website. We've been adding a lot more content there. Um, all of the messages uh, that have been recorded um, that are video messages are available there. Um, and also uh, a lot of the sermons that we've done, entire, uh, uh, entire worship services also are on the church's website that you can listen to. Um, so please keep those two places um, as ones that you visit often. And uh, I know you'll be able to keep up to date with whatever might be happening uh, here at the church. Um, also, please continue to remember John's family in your prayers. Um, all the people at Mars Hill know exactly who I'm talking about. Um, Gloria, especially, as uh, they are still mourning John's loss. And uh, I know we here at Mars Hill are, are lifting them up in, in prayer and um, praying that the Lord would help in, uh, in the grieving process, that they would um, be able to get through this. Um, please pray that everything would go well as they plan and uh, prepare for the funeral, that the Lord would bless with good weather there that things would go smoothly. Um, continue also, if you will, lifting up the many requests that have been going on, um, just ongoing uh, over the last couple of months. Um, as we continue to lift up all of our healthcare workers, uh, our doctors and nurses and their families especially, uh, that they would be kept safe. Um, continue to remember our law enforcement officers, uh, as well as all of our first responders, EMTs, as they are continuing to do a great work, but they're also in the front lines there. So please pray for them, as well as all of our government officials. A lot of choices have to be made in the coming weeks. So please pray that they would have wisdom to do what is right and what is good for all, um, that we might be able to be out of this time where we have to stay at home as uh, quickly as we possibly can. Um, so bow with me in a word of prayer as we ask the Lord's blessings on this time. Lord Jesus, uh, we come before you tonight giving you thanks and praise for the many blessings that you've given to us uh, each and every day for keeping us safe and keeping us well. And uh, Lord, we want to lift up this situation we have with our nation. We pray that you would guide and direct our leaders that you would help them to make the right decisions, that you would be with each healthcare worker, each nurse, um, that you would keep them and their, their families safe. For all of our first responders, that you would watch out over them during this time that I know is difficult as, as our, our nation is basically shut down. And Lord, we're all looking for that time where we're able to be out and about and do things again. I pray that you would hurry that along um, and that we would be able to enjoy that very soon. Um, Lord, we, we lift up uh, Gloria and, and all of John's family uh, in, your in our prayers, and we lift them into your hands. We pray that you'd give comfort and help during this most difficult time. Please bless the family um, for those that uh, are going to be able to attend the funeral, those that are mourning his loss. Please comfort them. And Lord, for us tonight, we pray that we would gain knowledge of your word, um, Lord, that we would be able to be lifted close into your presence, and we would be able to learn more about you, be challenged in our life, that we might live more passionately for you, for it's in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. 
Well, tonight we're going to start something new. I know we've been going through the book of Job, and I am planning on continuing uh, a study into Job just through articles uh, in the church's newsletter. Uh, I think it'll be a little bit easier to dig into that book and uh, unpack a lot of what's going on there overall. Uh, but tonight we're going to begin looking into the book of First Peter. And uh, this first message is going to be entitled, Things We Can Get Excited About. Um, now, if we think about that for a moment, we might begin uh, thinking about things that we would get excited about right now. Um, as we begin hearing that restrictions uh, that are in place might get lifted, uh, we might begin getting excited about some things that were rather mundane uh, not too long ago. I know I'm getting a little bit excited uh, thinking about the idea that I might be able to get a haircut soon. Um, being able to go to the store and there being toilet paper on the shelves, that is going to be a, an absolutely incredible thing. Um, I, I'll tell you how crazy it is. I'm not there yet. I'm going to make sure I say that. I am not to this place yet, but I am almost getting to the place where I would love to take Allison and Grace to the mall to go clothes shopping. Now, again, I'm telling you, I'm not there yet. About two more months and I'll be there. Um, but, you know, let's face it. As we think about things like that, uh, we are getting excited about some pretty regular things. And that's because we've been cooped up and we haven't been able to do the things that we really have wanted to do. We've been staying at home and we've just been running out for the essentials. We might be getting a going out for a meal or, or something like that, but we really haven't been able to do what we really, really want in these past this past month. You know, there was a group of Christians in about 60 AD that had it a whole lot worse than what we've had it. In about 60 AD, the city of Rome burned, and the Romans believed their emperor Nero had set these fires. And the reason why they believed he had set these fires is uh, because he had this great lust to build. He, he wanted to build new things, but in order to build new things, he had to tear down old things. So a lot of people believed he set these fires to do that. And the Romans at this time were totally devastated. Their culture, in a sense, went down with the city all the religious elements of their life were destroyed. Their great temples, the shrines, and even their household idols were burned up. Um, and this had great religious implications because it made them believe that all of these deities that they had in their house were unable to deal with the fire that had happened. Um, the people were homeless, they were helpless, and a lot of them had been killed. And there was a bitter resentment that was so severe, Nero realized he had to redirect this hostility. He had to redirect all of the anger. So he came up with this idea. The emperor's chosen scapegoat was the Christians. He decided to blame Christians for the fires. They were already hated because they had been uh, associating with the Jews and they were hostile to Roman culture. So Nero spread word quickly that the Christians had set the fires, and as a result, a vicious persecution against Christians began and soon spread throughout the Roman Empire. This persecution touched places north of the Tarsus Mountains like Pontus, Galatius, places we'll hear about in uh, 1 Peter 1. Uh, these were Jews and Gentiles that were most affected, but they needed spiritual strengthening because of their suffering. So the Apostle Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote this epistle to strengthen them and to encourage them. He wrote it to give them hope and encouragement, and he wrote it to give a people who were down and out something to, to look up to, to give them encouragement in the midst of their persecution, because undoubtedly they were depressed. They were wondering, when will this all end? Does that sound familiar? Peter begins this epistle, this letter, in a wonderful way. In 1 Peter 1, uh, verses 1 through 6, Peter basically shares the many reasons why Christians can rejoice. And I'd like to take a little bit of time and work, walk through these first six verses and see some things 
we can get excited about. And in these ver six verses here, we see four items all Christians possess which can bring excitement into our lives. These are things that if you know Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've got them. You've got them right now, and you can be excited about them. Um, we have a, we'll see, we'll have a privilege we can be excited about. We have a hope and an inheritance we can be excited about. And we have a security that we can be excited about. So let's look at, look at these four things. The first one is this, is that we can get excited about our privilege about our privilege. Uh, look in your Bibles, if you will, at verses 1 and 2 of 1 Peter chapter 1. The Word of God says this, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. First, notice this. There is no greater privilege that we have than being a child of God. The fact that we, in fact, could become children of God uh, is, is so incredible. That, that feeling, that privilege is absolutely indescribable. We, we look so vividly through the Easter season, the fact that Christ him, himself came down that we might be able to be God's children, that we might be able to be reconciled with him. And every believer has a privilege. And in, in, in these verses, Peter reveals some exciting facts about the privilege, about the amazing privilege that we have in being a Christian. Uh, notice just a couple of these. Number one, we have the privilege and we can be excited because we've been chosen. Uh, verse two says this, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Verse one talks about the elect. The King James Version in verse two says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. And I, I want to make sure we cover this in a way that we don't go down a rabbit trail um, towards election and predestination and, and free will. There's a lot written about that topic, and, and I would personally recommend uh, Norman Geisler's book, Chosen But Free, as it goes in-depth to, those two, sir, uh, to those, those two subjects. But here, as we look at this statement, please realize this amazing work God did. Um, he, he did a lot in preparing, in planning, in drawing you to a place where you would accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That, that is the amazing work of Jesus Christ in your life. He, he did an incredible work to bring you to the place where he would be your savior. Before you were born, God knew you needed Jesus Christ. He knew you were going to be a sinner and you needed a savior. Before you had ever heard the name of Jesus, God was setting up things for you to come to know Christ as your savior. The Bible says the Holy Spirit did a great work within you to open up your eyes and convict you of your sin that you might surrender to Christ. There was a whole massive work where God said, you know what, I'm coming after you. I'm coming after you because I want you to be my child. Uh, when we think about a firefighter who comes to rescue someone from a burning building, we understand the work the firefighter has to do to do that. The firefighter sees the person inside, and they break down a door. They run upstairs. And they might have to clear debris out of the way, but they come and they rescue the person in distress. And that shows the greatness and goodness of the one that rescues. And you know, the same is true of God. We think about all that God had to go through to say, you know what, I, I'm going to make a way for you and I to be children of God. And that's an amazing privilege for us to say, you know what? God sought me. As we sing in the old hymn, he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. We see God reaching out and doing all of these things, things we didn't even realize at first. And he chose to pursue each and every one of us. Though we were terrible sinners, God pursued me and now I'm saved. And I can say hallelujah. That is a privilege to be chosen. But not only that, we have been 
cleansed. We've been cleansed. Verse 2 also says this, in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ as for sprinkling with his blood. In the Old Testament, the blood of a sacrifice would be sprinkled according to the law. It would be a sin offering. It would be something that was done for the remission of sin. Um, this was a picture of the atoning work of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only hope we have of being cleansed, Peter reveals. Um, he, he even goes on and says that in verses 18 and 19. Um, he, he's basically saying this, that Jesus came, he lived a sinless life, was despised and rejected. He knew no sin, but became sin for us. He went to the cross and shed his blood for you and me, and that blood has the power to wash away all of your sins. Now, many of y'all know this already. Growing up, I worked in my grandfather's machine shop, and that place was a magnet for dirt and grease and oil and uh, all of the things you would regularly find in a machine shop. And uh, when I worked there, a lot of times my grandmother would come by and pick me up before everybody else would get off of work. Um, but the thing was, she would come and they would, uh, she'd be driving uh, their Lincoln Town Car. My grandparents had a great Lincoln Town Car. It was really nice, had really nice seats. It was a really nice looking car. But before I could get into that car, they'd have to do something. They would uh, put down a towel or a shopping bag and they would say, look, you're not allowed to touch anything. You can't do anything at all until you get home and you get a shower. Because I was covered. I mean, my clothing was filthy. My hands were filthy. But you know what was really nice, what I was really able to kind of rejoice in? Is when I got to go home and I got a shower and all of that grime, all of that dirt was just completely washed away and I was clean. I could re-enter society after that. Friends, aren't you happy that your sins have been washed away? No longer covered in the filth of sin. You know, that's exciting news too, because no one is too sinful. Listen, if you're listening to this, and this is the first time you've ever heard it, I don't care what you've done. It doesn't matter what your past is. It matters what Jesus Christ himself did in the past. The blood of Jesus Christ can wash every bit of your sins away. Now, because the blood of Christ has been shed, and any sinner who hears the call of the Spirit of God can be cleansed. We just have to simply cry out, Lord, I'm a sinner, and I need salvation. I need to be cleansed. See, not only have we been chosen and cleansed, but listen, we've also been changed. Verse 2 also says this, In sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience. What does it mean to sanctify? Or uh, what does that long word mean? It means to consecrate. It, it means to set apart. See, the Holy Spirit makes us holy by saving us and setting us apart uh, from sin and unbelief. And the sanctification process begins with that justification. Justification is the judicial act of God by which he pardons all the sins of those who believe in Christ and accounts, accepts, and treats them righteous in the eye of the law, that they've never even really done anything. Sanctification is also the process of purification that continues throughout our life. Through sanctification, we are not just set apart for salvation, we're changed, we're reborn. We are transformed. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. There is a change in the life of the believer. We will not reach sinless perfection in this life. But listen, when Jesus saves us, there is a change. John Newton, the writer of the hymn Amazing Grace, once said this, I am not all that I should be or what I want to be, but thank God I am not what I used to be. I know that I have a long way to go, but I know I have been changed. You know, that's a privilege that we enjoy. We enjoy the fact that God himself entered into our life and changed us. We rejoice in all that God did in that. 
so that we can say proudly, we can be excited that we have a privilege to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But beyond that, we can get excited about something else, and that is our hope. Our hope. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus went to the cross and died for our sins, but we know that he rose again. And Peter declares that because God raised Jesus from the dead, we as Christians can live with that hope. And notice that word hope here isn't wishful thinking. I know we, we hope for a lot of things. But this hope in the Bible speaks of confident expectations of things to come. Our hope is in a bodily resurrection of our own. Our hope comes from the fact that this life is not the end for us. It's not all we have to look forward to. Our hope is in eternal life because our hope is in Christ. And this blessed living hope was supplied by our Father. Notice verse 3 again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has called us to be born again to a living hope. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Listen, apart from Christ, we are pitiful, desperate sinners with absolutely no hope. But God, in his abundant mercy, he provided a way of salvation for mankind. One of the benefits of this salvation is this lively hope that Peter speaks of. This living hope in Christ. Just as Jesus was raised from the dead, we live in the hope of a literal bodily resurrection. That's lively hope. That's a living hope within us. And this hope of the resurrection is promised to us in the Word of God, as we've heard many, many times over. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That isn't wishful thinking. It is confident expectation that we possess as believers. And you know, that is something we can get excited about. Not only can we get excited about the hope of the resurrection, we can also get excited about what comes after the resurrection. In verse 4, we talk about our inheritance. We can get excited about our inheritance. Verse 4 says this, To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven, for you. Peter says that there is a priceless inheritance that is reserved in heaven for those who are saved. An inheritance is something that is received as a result of a personal relationship. And I don't know about you, I can get excited when I know I am going to go get some stuff. Grace, for her birthday, um, got to order a new phone case from Amazon. Um, but because of the virus, because of the shutdown, and uh, and all, uh, shipping has been very slow. And she asked me fairly often, you know, when is this case coming? Um, because in human nature, it's our nature to get excited about good things that are to come. And you know what? We can get excited because we have an inheritance in heaven that we are soon going to enjoy. Uh, look at some things about the inheritance that is promised to us in Christ. Um, look at the assessment of our inheritance. Uh, of our inheritance. Um, the beginning of verse 4 says it, that it, the inheritance is imperishable and, and undefiled. Now, there, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of things going on here. The, uh, the idea of an inheritance that is imperishable... For those that were reading this in Peter's day would have looked at that with longing eyes because these Christians had seen so much of their life be destroyed. Whether it be with the fires of Rome or being persecuted, their, their things had perished. Many of their homes had, had been burnt. 
Uh, many of their things had been stolen. Many of their properties had been repossessed. Why? Because they were Christians. But to have an inheritance that would not perish would be one that could not be touched by anybody else. It was never, ever, ever going to go away. Also, it says our inheritance is undefiled. It, it speaks of something that cannot be soiled or stained. It will remain unpolluted, unstained by evil or any bad thing. Heaven will not and cannot be touched by the things that defile this world. And you know, that gives an entirely different perspective on Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19, where Jesus says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust corrupt and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. You know, it gives a whole other call to the Christian life that we, in our life, shouldn't waste our time storing up earthly treasures, the things that one day are going to rust and, and just pass away, but we should cherish the things that we can store up in heaven that will last for all eternity. I don't know about you, but I am glad this coronavirus thing has not affected heaven one bit, and it will never affect heaven one bit. Um, we, we don't have to worry about it ever touching the gates of heaven because it's incorruptible. It's undefiled. It is kept by God himself. See, that's the uh, assessment of our heaven. But you know what? We can also rejoice in the, ins the assurance of our heritage, of our inheritance. Uh, verse 4 continues to say, unfading, kept in heaven for you. Now, that's really exciting. Because when it says, you know, reserved or in heaven or kept in heaven, um, it, it meant something to those that were reading it. Uh, in the New Testament, many people grew olive trees. Um, it took about 23 years for a tree to mature and to bear fruit. And these trees were often left as an inheritance because the olives could be sold for large sums of money. It was a, it was a good cash crop. It was really well used. In fact, today, if you go to the store and you look at olive oil, olive oil is very expensive as compared to uh, vegetable oil or corn oil. So here you have trees in the minds of people when it's talking about an inheritance because that was something that was greatly inherited in that day and they thought about the fires. And they talked about these things that were taken. The people that were being persecuted most likely had vineyards either burnt down or taken away from them because of this persecution. You know, when the people look, invading armies many a time would take away that inheritance by burning those crops. But the scripture says the inheritance of the heavenly kingdom, the inheritance of heaven is kept. This word literally means guarded. Peter is saying this, that our inheritance is as secure as if we already possess them within the gates of pearl by the crystal sea, that they are being kept not with human hands, but by the mighty hand of God. Keep in mind again, Peter was writing to a persecuted pre, uh, people and this expounded on the following, that they could never, ever lose this inheritance. And by the way, that's a good thing for us to do while we're at home. See, Peter was trying to get them to focus on what was never, ever, ever going to pass away. He said, listen, remember, even in the midst of your trials and the circumstances that you are in, always remember that there is an eternal treasure that you cannot lose. All the things in heaven and earth, the sky and the earth below, that can pass away. Things can burn up. Things can get repossessed. Things can get stolen. But the things of heaven will never, ever pass away. And that's something we should do. We, we are facing a rather difficult time. But you know what? This time here on earth, this rough time that we're going through, it has not affected our treasures in heaven one bit. It has not affected our eternal destiny at all. It is something that we can look at and go, you know what, God is still working on me, and I know this, my treasures in heaven are absolutely secure. You know what, you might be facing great difficulty in your life. Can I encourage you to keep on and keep fighting 
and remember what is waiting when this life is over. Heaven isn't a myth. It's not a fairy tale. It is an inheritance to every believer. It won't fade away. It cannot be taken from you. It is reserved, kept, guarded by God himself. And I don't know about you, but that gets me excited and I help, and I hope that it gets you excited as well. We got one last one. We can get excited also about our security. Our security. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5. Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. See, Peter not only revealed that their inheritance was reserved, he also proclaims that they themselves were kept by the power of God. Listen, if you are truly saved, you are also secure. Jesus put it this way in John 10, verse 28, And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gives them to me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. We aren't saved because of what we do. We are saved because of what Jesus did. We aren't secure because of what we do. We are secure because of who Jesus is. And simply put, you didn't work to earn your salvation, and you can't work to keep your salvation. You couldn't if you tried. Peter says that we are kept by the power of God. And he told us when God begins something, he himself finishes it. The Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians 1 and verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that which he hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And for all these things we, re we rejoice. 1 Peter 1, 6, the whole thrust of this message, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Notice the progression of this text. Peter tells us we can rejoice because we've been chosen, we've been pursued by God, and that we are His. And we reveal, He reveals the hope that we possess in this life in Christ. And He speaks about the promised inheritance in the next life. And then He tops it off by showing that we can have security and assurance that nothing and no one can ever take that away from us. You know, when we live in this time when a lot of the things that we love have been taken away from us. Being able to go out and, and share a cup of coffee with friends. Uh, being able to go and enjoy a nice meal at a restaurant. Being able to gather together as a church and worship our Lord and Savior. We've had a lot of things taken away from us, but I want us to remember something. There is something that we have not had taken away, and we can't have it taken away. Not by anyone around us, not by our government, not by anyone in this world. And that is our eternal security in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And you know, that's something we can absolutely rejoice in. And you know, because of this, we've got a lot of reasons to rejoice as we've looked tonight. We don't have a shortage of troubles, but you know what? We also don't have a shortage of things that we can rejoice over and we can thank God for. And you know, Right now, we've got a time where we hear a lot of bad news, um, and those troubles will many times discourage us. There's many sufferings in the Christian life, but we have to remember this. These things are only temporary, but, you know, as we'll see also as we continue looking into the book of First Peter, our troubles might be temporary, but many times they're also beneficial as well. The important thing for us is to focus on who we are in Christ and who we serve. And we've got to remember the promises that have been given to us. And we can rejoice in those regardless of our circumstance. Uh, maybe you've been focused on your troubles, on your trials, and those heavy burdens. Why don't you take this opportunity and bring them before the Lord today? Um, do what 1 Peter 5 7 says to cast all your cares upon Him. For he cares for you. Maybe you've seen some things today that excite you. Won't you come before the Lord and, and thank God for the privilege, the hope, and the security that you have in him. And just give God some praise. Just give God some worship today and say, Lord, you know what? I'm just going to take this time. I want to worship you for all that you've given to me. I don't deserve any of it, 
But Lord, you've given me so much. And, and God, I just want to thank you. But you know what? It might be you, you're you listening to this message and you're saying, you know what? I don't have any of those things because I don't have Christ. Um, the blessed truth that I can give you today is that Christ is available to you, even right now, wherever it is you're listening to this message. Um, the free pardon from sin in Jesus Christ is something that you can have right now because there's an abundance of mercy found at Christ. Um, why don't you come? Why don't you come even right now to receive that offer of salvation? Um, if so, I, I can guarantee if you receive Christ, you can have some great things to be excited about. Um, to come to Christ is as simple as surrendering your life to him, uh, and believing in him for your salvation. Um, it might be you want to come to God and accept Christ, but you just don't really know how to communicate that. And the, the great news is there's no magic words that you have to say. We accept by, by faith alone in his work on the cross and resurrection from the dead. It's not, not by words that we speak, but rather by faith. But you know, sometimes it's helpful to have words that can communicate what our hearts are feeling. Um, so if you would like to accept Christ as Savior, uh, let me lead you in a prayer. Uh, again, it isn't about the words we say. It's about the faith within our heart and placing our trust and faith in Christ Jesus. But if these words help you communicate that and, and basically to communicate what's in your heart today, I, I'd ask that you would, help, you would pray these with me. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I don't deserve eternal life. But I believe you died and rose from the grave to make me a new creation, to prepare me to dwell in your presence forever. Jesus, I ask now that you would come into my life. Please take control of my life, forgive my sins, and save me. And right now, to the very best of my ability, I'm placing my trust in you alone for my salvation, and I accept your free gift of eternal life. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer and truly meant it, you're a Christian. And I hope you will contact me through the church's website or uh, through the Facebook page or a church that's close to you to get a hold of a preacher there and say, look, this is what God did in my life. Um, and I, I pray that you'll commit to joining a church and following Christ in obedience in baptism and learning more about him and, and following him each and every day of your life because you've just now begun this walk and what a great journey it is. And I pray that you would be excited, that you would rejoice in the blessings that we have studied tonight because they're a part of your life as they're a part of every Christian's life. And church, I pray that you would rejoice in all of these things because you know what? We're going to go through a lot of different circumstances and trials and troubles in our life. But thanks be to God, he gives us so many, so many reasons to rejoice in his son because of the great gifts that he has given to us. Church, let's bow in a word of prayer as we close. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you tonight for your word, for the things we're able to rejoice in, and, and Lord, in which we're able to praise your name. And Lord, I pray now that you would help us, even in the midst of our trials, even in the midst of our difficulties that we're going through, that we would be able to look to you and say, you know what, we have so many things in eternity to, to rejoice in and, and so many things that we are able to, to give you praise for. Lord, help us to focus on those things and help us to live a life rejoicing in you. For it's in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Church, I love you. I miss you. Until we are able to meet together again, be safe and be well, and God bless you.